So we'll get started. And Alan, would you like to introduce uh, Terry? Yeah, and actually, Jake, would you mind pulling up the slide just so if anybody's joining us late, they know what we're doing for the next hour, hour and 15 minutes. Um, so we'll be ending at 12, but we're going to shift over to talking about some specific briefs. So, uh, and I'll let Jake uh, do the tee up, but we'll be talking about apples, meat processing, marketing, and food security. And then we should have a good another half an hour for Q&A after that. And then followed, we'll wrap it up with uh, both Abby Willard from the agency and myself to close out uh, by the time you're ready for your lunch. So Jake, do you wanna go ahead and tee off the brief presentations again? Yep. Um, yeah, and I wanted to uh, quickly say that, you know, the, the conversation questions that um, you all had for, um, for Heather is just a good example of, you know, these briefs and these presentations are meant to kind of pique your interest and, and, you know, there's obviously a lot more to discuss. And so um, more reason to invite these people in uh, to provide further testimony and and also connect you with with uh, others in the industry who can provide you know more depth and insight. So uh, it was really great to just see that exchange and and see the interest there. Um, and so we're going to kind of continue along the way with a product. Um, you know, we talked about Heather talked about grains, and and Terry's here to talk about. Um, uh, you know, an industry that's been in Vermont for quite some time and, and really is one of those flagship industries. Um, he's going to be here talking about uh, apples. And, and then from, from there, we're going to switch over, kind of talking more about some issues uh, with meat processing. So I mentioned there's, you know, there's a priority, recommend, uh, priority strategy related to meat processing, which Randy will give some more context for. Uh, then we'll we'll switch over to marketing, which there's a number of priority strategies related to marketing uh, that are really really critical. And so Rose Wilson um, and Lauren Masiria from Lauren from the Agency of Agriculture will be talking about the dynamics of marketing, um, the bake sort of the basic dynamics, and then how they apply. Uh, Lauren will be talking about metro markets, and then lastly, uh, Becca Warren and and Faye Mack will be talking about um, food security. The other thing I just want to say before I do hand it over to, to Terry um, is that we had planned to uh, feature the racial equity brief, uh, which is now complete. Um, unfortunately, the scheduling did not work for today with the contributing authors, but we really uh, we we'd love to work with the committees on on getting that brief presented to you or um, you know helping uh, to organize uh, a presentation um, with with those contributing authors um, at an, at another time. You know, obviously that's that's an issue that um, is is important all of the time, and so this should not be the only opportunity that we have to uh, talk about it and present that brief to you all. So, just wanted to make sure that uh, you were aware of that as well. Yep. So, with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to Terry, and he's going to be talking about apples, and this really continues that theme of you know priority strategies for needing to do industry development, support our associations. Um, and a number of other things. So Terry, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thumbs up if everyone can hear me. Anyone can hear me? Okay, excellent. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Terry Bradshaw. I've presented to this committee in a few different uh, ways over the years. So it's good to see uh, folks again, including my old neighbor, John O'Brien in the, in the Vermont sense of, you know, 10 miles being neighbors. Uh, so yeah, Terry Bradshaw, I'm the uh, assistant, I'm an assistant professor in the plant and soil science department at UVM. Uh, I also I wear many hats and I've, I've worn many hats over the years, uh, in particularly in particular in, in reference to the apple industry. Uh, I was the uh, president of our state association for about five years at a time when, um, when I took it over, really the association was in charge of putting on the annual meeting at the American Legion Hall and making sure that there was a plate of food and the bill was paid uh, this was 2009 uh, to when you know a lot of things changed at the agency. Uh, resources were starting to get short. Resources were shortening up uh, in UVM extension, and uh, all of a sudden I found that role a little bit more significant than it had been um, as a volunteer role. Um, I do have a small extension appointment, and I'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about the the brief. Um, 
But so I'll start off just talking about Apple's in terms of how they uh, how they lay large in Vermont, or maybe at one time laid large. Uh, there was a time not long ago, within certainly my my lifetime, when milk, maple, and apples, roughly in that order, although maple and apples maybe could kind of trade for each other at, at a certain time, were the three primary products that had any real um, you know exportable, meaning outside of the state, not necessarily outside the country, although there were uh, uh, international exports of apples, um, you know, wholesale products that were produced in the state of Vermont um, that were in quantity enough to 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 move and really have a pretty, a pretty strong market presence. Uh, 1999, uh, the legislature declared the Macintosh apple the state fruit, and throughout uh, the middle, I'd say the the glory years of the apple industry, say from the 1950s to the 1980s. Uh, it was not difficult for a farmer, uh, often in Addison County or in the lower uh, Connecticut Valley, uh, to make a living off of 10, maybe probably more realistically, 20 acres of apples, uh, put them on a truck, get paid, and put their kids through college. Um, that's changed, and it changed about, you know, I mean, it, took, it took some time. Really, like I said, the glory days started to end in the 80s, and there's a number of different uh, factors that have led to that. Um, I think all of us know that there are still apples grown and they're still one of our major agricultural products, but the days of them being uh, a major wholesale product, or I'll flip it around and say the days of people outside the state recognizing Vermont as a place where lots of apples come from are starting to, to change. Um, we saw some changes in um, the availability of produce coming in from uh, other countries, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere in the 80s, early 90s. Um, we had a, um, a real shakeup in the industry that affected the entire Apple industry when uh, the growth regulator Alar was banned in the 80s and uh, Macintosh, which was our primary Apple and still is our primary, primary Apple, um, used, uh, was frequently treated with Alar to prevent the fruit from dropping on the ground. Uh, and so that's in the way that campaign rolled out really impacted um, fruit prices immediately for about a one or two marketing seasons, but also uh, caused a lot of growers to uh, tr really try to figure out how to best manage this crop in a new era. Um, at the same time, we've seen major shifts in how apples are produced and, and anybody who's uh, been by some of the orchards in Shoreham. Um, Cornwall has got some good ones over to Barney Hodges Orchard. Uh, can see how um, apples now, when you think of a large sprawling tree that you could, uh, you know, sleep in the shade under, those, those really don't exist in terms of the larger industry, but yet they're all over Vermont. Uh, and I say that uh, because I want to highlight that we've had a tough time adapting to, or I should say investing in the changes that are happening in the industry. So apple trees have gotten smaller. We're now planting about a thousand trees per acre, 1200 trees per acre. So they look like uh, tomato bushes grown on wires. Um, it's a very highly efficient system in terms of labor efficiency, in terms of yield per acre, in terms of fruit quality. I mentioned that the old trees, you could, you could sleep in the shade under them. Um, well, shade means that there's no sunlight getting through and no sunlight means poor photosynthesis and small green fruit. So these changes in the industry, which started in Europe in the 1980s and have spread throughout the US are really expensive to adopt. Uh, and we've had, because these came around starting the 1990s um, and really since the, the, the 2000s, <clears throat> we haven't really had, our industry hasn't really had the capital cash flow to adopt to that. So we're kind of behind. We're, we're oftentimes managing um, large trees that are difficult to uh, manage labor-wise, um, relatively lower yield per acre, but that's not always true. And then on, along with that, so we've changed our trees, we're seeing a real change in what consumers are looking for for a quality fruit. So if you talk to a millennial or younger Macintosh is usually not what they're thinking of when they think of, of a top quality apple. Honeycrisp maybe, and we we certainly have Honeycrisp is roughly, if you put all of Macintosh's daughters, Empire, Cortland, Macallan, whatnot, in the same bucket with, with Macintosh, I would say Honeycrisp is next 
what's grown in Vermont. Um, it's a very difficult apple to grow. Um, and so it causes a lot of headache and it has a lot of post harvest uh, issues. And that's another piece that's made things kind of difficult is uh, throughout the 20th century, we had the Shoreham uh, Cooperative Apple Packing Association or the Shoreham Co-op. And uh, that has, uh, that went out of business around, around 2000. So we haven't had the central uh, 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 facilities for people to aggregate as Heather was talking about uh, before the break. So we've seen some changes. We do have, I wanna mention some bright spots. We have about the same number of growers even though we have half the acreage we had 20 years ago. And that's because we are seeing a number of small producers, pick your own you know, retail type farm stand uh, operations um, to where we have the same number, but we have dramatically less production. Um, cider is uh, increasingly a uh, product that apples are going into, but, um, and I mean fermented cider, um, but that requires, at least on a large scale, a robust wholesale industry where a grower can make 80% of his fruit, sell 80% of his fruit for $24, so he can afford to sell 20% of his fruit for $6, which is kind of the price point that it takes to, to put it into cider. Um, so I, I leave with that. I, again, I, I realize I kind of painted the, the bleak picture. Apples grow fabulously well in this state. Um, and there's a number of, of uh, policy things that, I, that the brief highlights um, that I think could help things along. And I think they're always going to be around, but the days of seeing, you know, the 200 acre orchards in Vermont are starting to wane. And I'll, I'll take questions from there. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Terry. Um, did, we should go on to the other speaker and then yep. take all the questions at the end. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Terry. And hopefully you can hang with us uh, to the Q&A portion um, around 11. We'll probably get to that around 1130. Um, so thank thank you uh, so much, uh, Terry. And so now we'll we'll go to uh, Randy Quenville, uh, who's going to be talking about meat processing. And obviously a lot of sort of a lot, a, a lot's been happening in that industry uh, through COVID and a lot was happening before. And so Randy's gonna you know, touch upon kind of uh, the areas of need, the areas of opportunity and, and some of the recommendations that are laid out in the brief. Um, and so Randy, uh, it's all yours. All right, hey, I'm here. Hey, hey everybody, um, nice to see you all again. Uh, I am the uh, former chief of meat inspection for Vermont, but uh, since I've gone, I've still been doing some stuff uh, with other uh, plants trying to get going um, under inspection. So um, done, I worked on this brief and, you know, as we know, this is kind of the meat processing beef, but it also talks about slaughter as well. So, you know, as we know, and as I've always said, it's critical to, to support the slaughter processing industries um, to, to make those inspected meat and poultry products available for the Vermont consumers and, and beyond Vermont as well. Um, and so, so again, as, as there's, a, there's a big shift of trying to increase the processing, um, that being said, the slaughter inspection is really key to any of the growth. So if you have the inspected carcasses to start with, you know, product then can be sent for further processing um, or it can go directly to retail. Um, you know, the processing inspection is critical to get um, to the wholesale markets and further um, processing, but there's also um, that retail um, exemption. So through retail exemptions um, and through through meat inspection approval, there's there's abilities for uh, farmers to market directly to individuals and do some further processing. Um, so all of these things they kind of circle back to the need for you know essential information, the access to the facilities, the access to trained employees, um, water quality information. So all of those are discussed in the, in the recommendations in the report. Um, so it all kind of circles back to having the support of, of all these items that are listed in the brief. Um, I think um, from what I've seen, I mean, I think it'd be good to have a concerted effort um, either by either ag development or the position recommended at UVM extension um, 
for um, uh, ascertaining the needs um, and what the current slaughter facilities can do. So do they have the, the ability to do more or the desire to provide you know, slaughter only services um, so that then those, those carcasses can go to processing. We already know that they're, they're slaughtering at capacity with all that they're able to process. So, but we kind of need to know, do they, do they have enough help to add extra slaughter um, as that takes workers away from processing? Um, do they have the means to ship carcasses? Do carcasses need to, to pick them up um, and bring them for, you know, places for further processing? I mean, usually uh, sides can be broken down into quarters and shipped without inspection. Anything more than that would have to be done during inspection hours. So, so that puts more, um, more pressure on the processing facilities. Uh, so I guess I, I'd like to say as a recap, you know, for um, anybody that meets inspection requirements gets 40 hours a week of inspection time at no cost. Um, there are some approved hours that, that they need to work under. So um, sometimes that's hard with farming and processing because you have to have those hours um, under inspection. Uh, so state inspection is usually sufficient to, to capture all the in-state markets. Uh, but Vermont has also um, established a CIS, a cooperative interstate shipment program. Uh, so even under with utilizing state inspectors, they can still do some interstate shipment of those inspected products. Um, you know, federal inspection is also available and Vermont still has a cross utilization program as well to help those smaller places get going and business. So the, uh, the, the support of the meat inspection program as well, making sure that they have enough people, um, the ability to increase um, their coverage as needed, because again, as these small places start, um, if they don't have inspection, then they can't get going. So um, again, it seems as though more and more people are trying to get that processing going to alleviate the, the stress on those slaughter processing plants. Again, if we can get those, the, the slaughter plants to be able to have enough qualified people um, to be able to, to, to do that work. Again, that we find that um, there, there seems to be a lack of uh, trained people. So, you know, supporting again through, you know, what, what's listed in the brief um, as far as training programs, either through schools and universities, maybe connecting the training with a central in incubator kitchen. Um, you know, the Mad River Food Hub is not doing that type of work now. But again, if there is some sort of business that could do that, um, they were an integral part of, of several, you know, startup businesses that went on to build their own facilities, obtain inspection, places like Joe's Soup, Screaming Ridge Farm, uh, Pie and Pasta, Babette's Table, Vermont Salumi. Those are all places that started, that were able to get their start and figure out inspection and then further, you know, build up their market before they made that big leap into, into inspection and processing. So realistically, that's kind of where we're at. It's not a lot of change since from since I left. Um, but those are, again, those are most of the recommendations that are in the report. Um, there's still some other things that could be um, um, looked at um, to help expand different markets. I mean, if farmers can can incorporate meat and poultry into their operations, it helps them weather the changes between the different, you know, the dependency on weather, um, uh, crops, and all that stuff. So that's kind of where we're at. That's what uh, I think, again, it hasn't changed a lot, but those are the, the things. So, and I'll be around here for the, the Q&A um, and go from there. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Randy. And I'm sure, uh, yeah, I'm sure there will be more, more questions uh, on the slaughter processing uh, uh, brief. Uh, so that's great that you can stick around. Um, and so now we are going to uh, shift, shift gears a little bit um, and, and look at marketing. So we've talked a lot about, you know, very specific product areas, uh, you know, grains, apples, meat products, and um, you know, there's there's still the issue of how do you get those products to market, um, and how do you get consumers to to kind of notice them and buy them? Um, and so, you know, this is I think marketing is this area that is often misunderstood. And so, hopefully, uh, we've got two excellent presenters. So Rose Wilson is going to give us the the kind of marketing 101 um, and and a couple of recommendations from that brief that help us uh, to steer us in the right direction. And then Laura Masseria 
is going to be touching upon you know the metro market area, which is a, a large area, a large sort of place that exists, but is often talked about as you know an area of opportunity. And so there's this connection here of uh, Rose's marketing, sort of marketing 101. How do you do it? How do you do it well? And then Lauren's going to be talking about sort of how how can we do that well in the metro market areas uh, to reach all the consumers that um, are, are out there in our region. So uh, with that, I will now turn to Rose. So Rose, go ahead. Hey, folks. Um, thanks for having us. So uh, with respect to marketing, I've been working uh, doing business planning and market development with farms since I was at Harpoon Brewery um, in the early 2000s. So I've been doing this for quite a while. And what we've seen over time is that our local food market has um, gone from an emerging market where we had rapid growth to a maturing market. What the maturing market means is that we have a, a larger playing field. There's more people interested in local food, but the rate of adoption is slowing and there's increased competition. So we're cannibalizing within our market and we're also attracting the attention of large national brands who want a piece of the local market pie. And so what, what that does is it changes the playing field in terms of where we used to have a lot of direct to consumer relationships and you knew who your farm was and you knew why you valued local food. Now local food has gotten fancy, the packaging has gotten fancy, the marketing has gotten fancy. And while the pie is larger, each farm's ability to access that pie is getting narrower. And so if our farms don't begin to compete on a marketing level equivalent to the competition, what happens is they're slowly going to get left by the wayside. So with a maturing market, it means that you have to spend more on marketing that you might not have had to spend before. And one of the things that we wanted to make sure the legislature um, is aware of is what we mean when we say marketing, because marketing most people think of as advertising and promotion, but marketing actually represents a whole lot of aspects in addition to advertising and promotion. So it means what is your product? Is your product still relevant to your consumers nowadays? So before you might've had a carrot, but now people might want a peeled carrot or an organic carrot. So you have to explore what is your product and is my product still meeting my customer's needs? Is my packaging still relevant? We went through an era where we had no packaging, then everybody needed fancy packaging. And now we're back to an era where people are like, oh my God, look at all the plastic going into the ocean. We need to rethink our packaging. There's two aspects to packaging. One is, is your product getting to your consumers intact? And two, is it helping your product stand out on the shelf? And three, is it meeting your customers' needs? So um, we also mean pricing. When you look at your product, is it priced right? Will it sell on the shelf? As we get larger competition coming in, we tend to find that there's price pressure. And so you have to increase what your value proposition is. You have to really know what you stand for. You have to understand how your pricing fits into the landscape around you. And you also still have to be able to operate profitably within the pricing that you might need to be um, adopting. We have um, placement. So, Again, as the market has matured, we've gone from direct consumer sales to an increasing amount of um, wholesale and regional sales. And what does that mean to your ability to access those markets? Oftentimes, in order to actually get into the wholesale market or get into a distribution change, you, you do need to up your marketing um, efforts. And once you're in those environments, where are you on the shelf? So big brands pay big money so that they're not at foot level. They want to be at eye level on the shelf. When we talk about marketing, we also mean your people. Do you have the sales staff to support inroads with retailers, inroads with consumers? Um, do you have the customer service staff to be able to actually respond effectively when somebody has an issue with your product? And also processes. What is your order fulfillment process? Are you... Um, someone who can support the needs of your market 
uh, in a timely fashion, in a professional fashion. Similarly, <coughs> what is that physical presence that you have? Do you look like you're a professional, reputable operation? So what does the farm look like? What does the front office look like? What does your web presence look like? And then we also mean advertising and promotion. So what strategies are you doing to maintain, retain, and actually grow your market share? It, it's um, in terms of barriers, the, everybody would love to do it. The problem is it's expensive. It's expensive and it actually requires skills and expertise. So um, what are the key opportunities? I think some of the key opportunities we have is for folks to actually step back and say, oh, I actually do need to up my marketing game, do a self-assessment and start doing brand audits where we can say, what are the areas that you do well within those marketing aspects? Where are the areas that you need help? And then secondly, most of our brands are too small to afford a full robust sales and marketing team on their own. We just don't, they're expensive individuals to hire. And at the scale that our brands are at, they can't support hiring those people full time. What we have identified is that within Vermont, if individuals were to rise to the challenge of being contract sales for multiple brands, they can develop a pretty nice livelihood supporting each farm or each brand within that small percentage of time that they need um, to be able to help them get that, that professional expertise that they need out in the field. Um, so there's definitely opportunity there for, for folks. And then with respect to our recommendations, um, I thought there was three key recommendations that would be of use for the legislature. There's a couple big spend asks. One is that um, we think it would be really important for Vermont to invest in a, a buy local, buy Vermont campaign um, specifically for the general public, because one of the things that most people don't know is that as much as the trend to go buying local has moved towards retailers, even our largest wholesale growers do rely fairly significantly on the higher margin they get from their direct to consumer sales. So being able to continue to support having people have that direct connection to their farms when they can, and also when they are going into the grocery stores, really starting to value buying that local option when they see it available. The second thing that would be really relevant is, again, as I mentioned, even within Vermont, having um, contract sales or brokers that can be supporting multiple farms, um, working with Lauren in the metro markets to have contract brokers that can be supporting several of our brands that are trying to get out of state that really need a high level of sales and marketing support. So having some brokers um, to support our efforts to get into the metro markets. And then the last um, recommendation is a fairly small ask. We're looking at about $5,000 to support farms being able to go to conferences, some fairly well-known national conferences so that they can get exposure to um, what is happening in the industry with respect to what are other brands doing? What are the trends? How do you interact with a broker? How do you interact with the distributors? Starting to network, networking goes a long way. And if our, if our um, brands and our farms don't have the ability to actually get access to those individuals, it, um, it can make it hard to, to get out there. So just being able to support the expense of getting to those conferences and enabling those names and faces to gain recognition would be great. All right, awesome. Thanks, Rose. Um, and uh, again, yeah, we'll, we'll hold on questions. Uh, that was a really fantastic overview of marketing. And, and yeah, I think the marketing brief uh, provides a lot, a lot of additional detail to many of the points that that Rose made and there's there's other recommendations there as well. So thank you. Thank you, Rose. And with that, we'll turn to Lauren to kind of uh, help uh, sort of support some of the points that uh, Rose was, was making and give it some more specific context uh, in relation to Metro Market. So Lauren, go ahead. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Masseria with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. I'm the Senior Market Development Specialist. 
So I'll go over some of the high points of the major metro market brief, which is found on page 116 of the plan. So when I was asked to pull this brief together, I'm, I'm trained as an urban planner. So my first question was, what does this mean, major metro markets? So I really wanted to define that area that we were working with. So we looked at Montpelier as the center and a six hour radius from Montpelier and called that the major metro area that we're talking about in this brief. Um, we chose Montpelier because it's about us. We chose this area because it's about six hours from Montpelier. Um, and there are 49 metro areas within this, 49 major metro areas within that six hour drive from Montpelier and about 50 million people and 18,000 grocery stores. So I really wanted to get my head around, okay, what is the scale that we're dealing with here? And if you look on page 113, you'll see a small map that kind of shows where all these metro areas are, um, as well as the density of grocery stores. Um, and so what we think is that without the support of these regional consumers, specifically in some of these metro areas, that the growth and earning potential of Vermont farm and food businesses will be limited and this really important sector will see stagnation or begin to shrink. Um, and it's important to note, as Rose kind of mentioned in her summary, that when Vermont products are sold in regional markets, they do compete directly with international, national, and other regional brands. Um, and because the products are being sold outside of Vermont, the connection to place is lost or weakened. And so as a result, it's more difficult to garner the same premium price that we may be, we may be able to get or businesses can get in Vermont. Um, and the sentiment when writing this brief was that the further geographically you get from Vermont, the less of an affinity or familiarity consumers have with Vermont products. Um, so the bottlenecks, opportunities, and recommendations are for this brief are truly a mix of what you'll find in many of the other briefs, especially the marketing, distribution, consumer preferences, business assistance brief. Um, because so many of these topics come into play in these major metro areas. But generally, selling beyond local markets requires energy and expertise. And again, Rose kind of highlighted this as well, but wholesaling requires time and attention, and that can be very difficult for small businesses. Um, we have gone into greater detail, but there's a, a wide range of skills that a business owner needs. Um, that they need to master, which ranges from paperwork to building relationships and to understanding how the wholesale markets actually work. So from that shelf placement to meeting with distributors to understanding all the different models, that can take a lot of time and energy. And in addition, <laughs> the business owner is trying to optimize their own business practices. Um, in it, Additionally, the producers must have sufficient volume to warrant the cost of freight. Um, and consumers and oftentimes times retailers expect a high level of professionalism and consistent, consistency in quality. So when applicable, if you have a packaged product, branding is also extremely important when your product is on the shelf with, with these other international, national, and re regional brands. But given the number of people who live within this major metro area or within our defined major metro area, we think that there's a ton of opportunity. So there's definitely opportunity in cooperative marketing and distribution, um, potentially alternative methods of distribution and consumption, which has really never been more relevant than now with COVID, but um, you know, pre-cut veggies, pre-packaged, ready-to-cook items, um, selling direct-to-consumer models, um, and capitalizing on some of these other convenience trends. And then again, especially within the COVID times, um, having a strong online presence and the ability to reach your consumers. So whether that's via email, social media, et cetera. 
So I'll point you to two of the priority, priority recommendations on page 197. Um, priority strategy number 16, which is to fund coordinated marketing efforts such as a statewide marketing campaign for local products, um, marketing support in emerging, emerging metro areas, and a shared marketing broker position. So this came up in kind of two different ways in the major Metro brief is recommendation two and five. And then priority strategy number 17, also on page 197, but to help individual farms and food businesses reach new customers by developing tailored marketing assistance services and programs. And so this really focuses on building the business's capacity and helping them kind of learn these SOPs so that they have a strong relationship with their customers and can carry that on. Thank you. All right, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, that, was, that was excellent. And yes, again, I know there's probably a lot of questions that are coming up at this point, but we're almost uh, to to the end here over the brief presentations, and then we can shift over to Q and A. Um, so now uh, we will turn over uh, to Becca Warren and and Faye Mack uh, to talk about food security. And as I was mentioning, with with the goals that are related to kind of food access and food security um, in the plan, that you know food security is multifaceted. Uh, there's many different sort of dimensions to it, and I think you know, in this conversation about you know, production and kind of regional markets. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of what's been happening through COVID too is supply chain disruptions, you know, has really posed a lot of big questions about uh, how do we create, you know, food security in Vermont, how we create food security in, in the Northeast um, during these, you know, times of disruption and also during times uh, when things uh, are re relatively normal, whatever that may, may or may not mean uh, nowadays. So that's, um, what uh, Becca and, and Faye will be kind of discussing a little bit here um, with the food security brief. So um, Becca, uh, it's all yours. Thank you, Jake. Um, and good morning, everyone. I'm Becca Warren with the Sustainable Jobs Fund. And thank you for this opportunity. I wrote the issue brief on food security, which you can find on page 157 of the printed plan. Um, and that was in collaboration with experts from the anti-hunger community, regional planners and academics. And Faye Mack from Hunger Free uh, is one of the contributors and has joined today to help answer questions that might come up about food insecurity, as well as just visually show this cross sector um, interest in, in food security in the state. So in the brief, we considered both individual food security and the security of Vermont's entire food system. And we found that there is no holistic plan to protect Vermont's food supply, nor the individual food security of Vermonters during emergencies or against the changes we know are coming with climate change. But there is a lot of excitement in developing a comprehensive approach to food security. Jake made reference to the four pillars of food security uh, earlier, and those are availability, access, utilization, and stability. Um, we have definitely experienced the fragility of these pillars over the past year. Um, one in three Vermonters has experienced individual food insecurity during the course of the pandemic. And we've also seen disruptions um, to national food supply chains so the closure of meat packing plants, for example, the plowing under of vegetable crops. Um, and in, just to continue with the example of meat, we know we've seen this national disruption, both increasing demand in the state for meat and exposing the limits of our processing infrastructure as Randy was discussing. But because of our strong agricultural sector, we believe Vermont has a unique opportunity to over the next decade, ensure that food remains available, accessible, and stable, and that all of our residents are food secure. And the food security brief recommends fully funding the proven programs that assist vulnerable Vermonters with an especial emphasis on those programs that include our agricultural businesses as part of the solution. So programs like Crop Cash, Vermonters Feeding Vermonters, Universal School Meals, which are impactful on individual food security and also circulate economic benefits within the agricultural sector and the state as a whole. 
And your committees, uh, I believe, have also heard testimony about updating the state emergency management plans to ensure food security during disasters. And this step is part of the recommendation from the brief to adopt state policies and plans to ensure that the Vermont food supply itself can weather the emergencies that are caused by climate change, pandemics, or um, unforeseen other disasters. So the, the state is taking these steps and many other good steps toward food security, but um, individual steps are not necessarily going to get us where we need to go and want to go. So the priority strategy I wanna to highlight today and leave you with is this strategy of charting a comprehensive approach toward food security in Vermont and centering it around our thriving and, and diverse um, agricultural economy. So a, a comprehensive approach would weave together issues such as affordable housing, healthcare, um, affordable transportation, the siting of grocery stores, food distribution, access to local foods, and then the systems for ensuring continued production and expanded production of food in Vermont. So really this plan, all the topics that we covered in the strategic plan in the briefs really relate to this food security question. And I want to, um, you know, following up on Senator Pearson's idea of a picture, I have a very clear picture in my head of the closed store in Cambridgeport which was open when I was a kid. It was a place people would get food of various types, healthy popsicles, a, a range of things. So what is the holistic approach that might get the Cambridgeport General Store literally shuttered right now to look more like the Greensboro General Store? That's, what, that's the picture that we're talking about with this. And so the, the Farm to Plate Network is the starting place for creating this holistic approach um, and it's also going to involve working with our neighboring states to reorient a significant part of our food production and all the components of the food system to the regional level. So we can reduce risks to our food system and we can protect the most vulnerable in our state by creating a cohesive approach. And we're excited to work together to do that. So thank you for this opportunity. Fantastic. Thank you, Becca. That was um, just a really nice and concise uh, explanation and, and uh, summary of, of the brief and, and the issues in there. And um, yeah, uh, just a really wonderful kind of summary of things. Um, and so with that, uh, we, we are now at a point in time where we can <laughs> have a little more dialogue and conversation here uh, with Q&A. And so we'll try to, you know, we have about a good 15 minutes that, that we can probably um, have for Q&A and discussion. And so all of the, the brief authors here are available to you. So um, we're really just excited to hear what your questions are and, and kind of uh, hopefully uh, direct you in a coordinated fashion to a person who can, who can answer your question. Is, hey, uh, Jake, is uh, Faye gonna, is she gonna present? Or? Uh, Faye is, is here to support uh, Becca in terms of answering questions that may arise that related to food security. Yeah. But that, yeah, the presentation okay. portion is, is complete now. Yeah. So, so we'll open it up to uh, <clears throat> questions from uh, legislators. Um, so are we, um, do we have questions? Um, uh, one I have, if we back up a ways, is um, uh, for Randy uh, Quinville in regards to uh, uh, his knowledge of slaughter facilities for small animals. Um, we've heard from a goat, a goat farmer that it costs more to get the goat uh, processed and slaughtered than he, the goat meat is worth and and I'm wondering if we if we have a adequate uh, place for small uh, animals to be processed uh, or is are we lacking in that particular area uh yes yeah, so uh in in the um in the meat brief it does talk about being able to um, expand that that type of slaughter because again there's the um, there's the halal market um, there's the the farmers that are are diversifying into raising those types of animals 
So, but you're right. Most of the um, established facilities now um, concentrate on beef and pork because it's it's just more profitable. Uh, so, but if you could establish a place that is set up for that type of of slaughter, then it would would absolutely help to increase that part of the marketplace. Um, so I know, you know, at one point there was, uh, you know, at the Royal Butcher, they had a separate uh, slaughter floor set up just for those types of animals. And that worked really well. Um, I, I don't know what's happened with the Grand Isle facility, but that was set up for, for small um, animals, calves and sort of thing as well. So, um, so, so yeah, I think that um, there was some interest from the Goat Club Collaborative um, working with the Vermont um, goat dairy producers to try to help find a place for an outlet for those types of products as well. But I'm not quite sure where they're at at this point. As I understand, they haven't moved forward with that, but they did put up a building. But I, I don't know if it's just because they don't have the help yet um, or, or they haven't basically establish what that market is. Again, which goes back to the marketing side of stuff that Rose was talking about. Yeah, um, thank you, Randy. Are there you questions are. from? Bobby, do you see that Terry's hand is up? No. So you watch the screen and we'll work them in. Uh, so um, is it Carrie? T Terry Norris. Oh, no, I miss Terry. <laughs> do, 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 do you see the little the little hands, the little blue boxes with hands in them? No, you just put your finger up. We don't have that fancy stuff on the center. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, you know, just do see my finger. That's all you need. <laughs> no, uh, go ahead, uh, Terry. Yeah, I was just uh, just going to say that uh, when Terry Bradshaw said that Shoreham used to be like the apple capital of uh, Vermont, because I moved here in 1960 and they were, I mean, they were everywhere. And now I could be mistaken, but I believe we're down to one, one orchard right now, one person that does uh, all of the orchards that are left in the in town. So not sure if that's a good thing or not, but uh, it is what it is. I mean, we've lost uh, uh, the one of the most popular pick your owns, Douglas Orchards. They, they were acquired by Champlain Orchards and, and uh, Blodgett's went out of business two years ago. So and some of their orchards is taken over by Champlain, but the rest is kind of got pushed down and cut up. So it's a, a change. And what what is uh, transpiring on that land at the present, uh, Terry? Uh, well, Douglas is are gonna their orchard is still going to be maintained supposedly the same way they have always done it but it's owned by Champlain Orchards, which they used to be in competition, but, and uh, Blodgett's, they, I think they might uh, store some hemp in the uh, processing, you know, cold storage, oh. but uh, a lot of their trees, they, they just stop pruning them. And, you know, in about two years, if you don't prune your trees, they look like, you yeah. know, brush. And, and quite a bit of it was cut down and, uh, and just kind of left. Yeah. Um, other questions? Uh, from Bobby, Terry Bradshaw members? has his hand up. Yeah, I, oh, I'm on mute. Yeah, I just yeah. want to respond to that and highlight, um, you know, the picture that I painted, you know, I didn't really touch on the kind of recommendations and what we want to do. And partially that was intentional uh, also, I can be long winded, but um, so many of the things that affect apples also that that landscape is the same thing we see in dairy that we saw a long time ago in in sheep where we have an industry that was able to be built when prices were good. And then when prices start to get more cutthroat, we see consolidation 
and then eventually reduction, you know, where you have those more marginal businesses. And so, uh, as the other Terry mentioned, uh, in Shoreham, you have one producer, Champlain Orchards, and Bill's a friend, and he does a great job of what he does, um, who's now, if there's any commercial orchard in that town, he's running it. It's not very different from what we're seeing in, in parts of the dairy industry, where someone uh, may have bought their three neighbors and now has one farm, and that's what it takes to run on that kind of cutthroats, uh, um, you know, sh you know, really narrow margins. Um, Terry, how much do I, how much do Vermont apples sell for at the present time for a good uh, eating, you know, store apple? Yeah, good question. Um, a, a Macintosh, that I'd have to look at the reports, they change every week, but it's somewhere in the range of 18 to if you have a, if the quality is high enough, the size is right, the color is right, and the market is accepting them, you know, maybe up to $32 a bushel, maybe, but that's, that's for the best of the best, and there's not many that make it. Um, the bigger issue is that and most of them sell for probably 16 to 20. Production costs are in the 16 to 18 dollar range. So again, you're in the milk model. Um, yeah. The trick is the high value apples that are being grown out west. You know that are that are fetching 60 dollars a bushel. We don't really have access to. We don't have the capital to replant, and there's some trade restrictions, or I should say, some licensing restrictions that keep Vermont out of that game. Um, so the hot new apples you see, the Cosmic Crisp, and things like that. We, we legally cannot grow them. They're, they're grown under a closed cooperative uh, and that's leaving growers kind of in the dust. Yep. Uh, questions uh, from other members? The uh, Carolyn. <laughs> Got my finger going. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, just Bobby. keep it in the right direction. Yeah, I was, I was gonna make a comment on you know, fingers, but um, but I, I think one of the things that I find interesting and, and John O'Brien referenced it earlier in this conversation was um, the the sheep industry that happened back in the 1800s and, and sort of keeping in mind and learning a lesson from that in that, um, you know, and I, I, I don't wanna put the kibosh on anything. I think all of this is so interesting and, <clears throat> but, we should probably keep in mind that we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. So I think that the whole diversification thing is important. Um, I think one of the one of the uh, problems for the sheep industry back in the 1800s was that all of a sudden Australia and other places started growing uh, sheep and fiber and what have you very cheaply, and and they were stiff competition. Um, but I just want to ask Becca. Becca, are you Sally and, and Richard's daughter? I am. All right. When you mentioned the Cambridge Board store, which unfortunately is closed, I thought about all the ice cream sandwiches I bought there as I was campaigning for office over the years. So. Yeah. My, I, one day my dad said, we got to go to the Cambridge Sport store. The popsicles are five cents. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm real sorry that place is closed now. <laughs> Thank you. I I think uh, I don't. We haven't heard this as committees, but I believe Abby. You know, we were talking about uh, Randy and um, uh, was talking in regards to me how we needed to do some type of a survey of the facilities, and I I think did did you folks Abby at the agency. Uh, do a, a little mini survey of the facilities to see what it would take uh, to to advance them uh, into a better position so they could slaughter more and package more. Yeah, so Senator Sir, um, uh, we're going to talk about this, I think, tomorrow in our testimony, yeah. but there's a few things that happened. Um, Actually, Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, led by Ellen personally, and I think some of her staff reached out to our slaughter and processing facilities during the early stages of the pandemic to get a sense of how compliant they were with the PPE requirements or that they had the additional staff necessary to take on the additional safety requirements 
in our processing facilities to ensure that we didn't end up in the same situation in the Midwest at Smithfield facilities and the like that had to close due to high COVID cases. So we have some of that feedback from Ellen's conversations. We also did outreach to our slaughter and processing facilities to suggest ways that they could um, expand production, add an additional shift, or find ways to increase their capacity to respond to the increased demand for local. So those were just suggestions that we offered. We even offered whether our inspection staff could run additional shifts and run overtime to allow those businesses to add additional slaughter or processing shifts. But that was more of an offer than it was a than feedback. Yeah, so we'll hear more about this tomorrow. Uh, anyhow, so um, uh, thank you, Abby. Sure. Um, are there other questions from any of the members? If no, if not, uh, moving um, moving down to the metro sales area. Um, I'm wondering when when you go metro with your milk, they they charge you slotting fees, they charge you shelf space. Um, if you have to use a cooler, of course, they charge you the stores. And I'm wondering, is that true uh, with uh, fruits and vegetables? If you, if you move to the more metropolitan areas, do they assess a fee on, on you as a uh, presenter of these products? Does anyone know that or know the answer to that? Rose, do you want to take a crack at that? Sure. Sure. Um, yes, oftentimes, regardless of the industry, the more that we start interacting in the, the national competitive landscape, that comes back to that marketing. If you want that placement, if you don't want to be down at somebody's feet, you're going to have to pay to get into a, a placement that is more visible or accessible. We talk it in the cooler doors. If you wanna be on the side of the cooler door that opens as opposed to the side of the cooler door at the hinge, it's going to cost money and then you have to also protect it. Um, all of those things do tend to require money and the large brands that pay that money don't like to give up those spaces very easily. Um, so it, it can be a challenge to get good placement for sure. Yeah. And what about, I think you talked a little bit about um, working through a broker to get this all set up. Um, uh, what do they, you know, that costs money as well, right? Yes, that's actually why we were looking at potentially starting to try and develop some, some new brokers. Most of the established brokers, and this is why we want to get some of our, our brands and our farms that are looking at going out of state to actually start interacting on this national level. Most of the brokers that work on that larger regional level require at least 2 million in sales before they'll even start talking to you. Um, so we had one of our larger vegetable growers who actually was really proud. They came with me to one of those national conferences and they were in 200, I think it was 200 Whole Foods, and they were really excited. And the broker looked at him and he was like, well, call me when you're 10 times bigger. And that really put, it, it was really disheartening for both me and the grower because we were both pretty excited for him. Um, but it, it just goes back to that. They look at us like we're tiny um, little brands. And, and so if we can start with brokers, if we can develop our own, brokers that have the interest in supporting our Vermont brands. Um, and that would go a long way towards helping. What about, if, are there other questions? See any, Carolyn? I don't see any hands. What about, um, you know, we, pardon? Uh, I we said, I don't see a, any uh, hands. Good. Um, we have a, uh, you know, a, 
I don't know, 13 or 15 day show down at Eastern States uh, each year. And yeah, there's, there's thousands of people that go through our Vermont building. Uh, and I'm wondering, do, do any of you folks know of people that display and their products uh, there, you know, as far as, uh, I know the cider guys are there and, and uh, you know, Cabot cheese is there, but what about, uh, is there any way we could display like veggies and promote the, that there, um, you know, as a, you know, Maine does, you know, potatoes in there. You know, you see people walking all over the place uh, with their baked stuffed potato and, and I'm wondering, is, is that a marketing area that we that we do use and utilize, or is that something we could do in that to help uh, promote our out of state or our metro sales? Lauren, I yep. see you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I run the Vermont, or I, I manage the building, the Vermont building at the Big E. So I am down there for not not the whole 25 days that we have staff there, but oftentimes like 13 to 15 days. Um, we do, we, we put an application out each year to, to solicit vendors to come to the Vermont building. Um, many of our vendors are returning vendors, as you mentioned, like Cold Hollow, um, American Flatbread. And we are oftentimes calling out the need for more prepared foods. I think fresh veggies might be a challenge at the Big E because it is a, a, an ag fair, but, but it's really focused on like fried Oreos and deep fried pickles. So I don't know that anyone really wants to like get a fresh carrot and walk around the fair with that. So it this wouldn't be that market, but certainly if people had creative ideas on how to incorporate um, local food into a prepared food meal, that would be um, relevant and, and totally, we would be excited about reading an application that looked like that. This year Bobby, we're not, oops, sorry, go no, ahead. No, finish your thought. I just wanted to let Bobby know that John O'Brien has his hand up. So my, my last thought was this year, we're not doing a public application right now. We're holding off until we see what happens with the Big E because last year it was canceled. Um, but we will have some open slots if we do run, if, if, it, if the fair opens, so. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Uh, mm -hmm. John, I, I see you, John. <laughs> uh, thanks, Bobby. I Just thinking about what Terry said about, um, you know, Vermont's a great place to, or, or apples grow really well in Vermont, right? Um, and, and, you know, maple trees too, but more and more, it's not enough. Um, so I was thinking, uh, just, just throwing it out to this group, uh, are the are the going forward uh, are our economic uh, advantages of of being in Vermont more about education in some ways? Like I'm thinking, like our committee's been hearing a lot about soil from Heather Darby and others. And so, if if regenerative agriculture, um, if Vermont can lead in that, we could have the best soil in the country. Not necessarily you wouldn't think of it necessarily as a product, but what it does with climate change and everything else may give us that competitive advantage. On the, on the other side of things, on the, on the far side, if we, if we teach, say, the Northeast that, that local food is going to be slightly more expensive, but very high quality, and, and there's a connection to farmers, that's an economic advantage, too. So, so those kind of big picture issues, I just wanted, wanted to know what this group, um, where, where, say, in, 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 this, in the big book, that is, and, and uh and just in general, you know, is that where we're headed? That that Vermont isn't exceptional in what we what we could produce, but but there are other avenues, especially education, where we could have a step up. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, got any answers to John? I Jake, no. did you want to jump I in? Hope, or? John, you aren't gonna. 
Right, go ahead. No, I, I just, uh, Representative O'Brien, it's a great question. And I think that's part of uh, what we were trying to hit on here with the, the strategic plan is that it's not one thing, right? There's no one silver bullet that's going to allow us to excel as a state or and within the, the region as well as within the country. But it's these lots of different components uh, and the, taking that more diversified approach, as we've been talking about all morning, that's where we can really excel and shine. But to do that well, as we've heard from all of the different uh, presenters, we need really strong support for marketing. We need really strong support for technical and business assistance. There needs to be better infrastructure. Like we just need the support system around our farm and food businesses to be uh, much more robust than what we've done in the past. We need to invest in that. And through that, then we let the farmers and food producers who do what they do best, they produce amazing food, let them really do that and do that well. And the rest of us then support them in doing it and getting it to market so that both Vermonters as well as folks in the Northeast uh, can take advantage of that. So um, I think that's, um, uh, way I would answer that question. And um, Mr. Chair, if you're okay, we'd like to shift uh, over to um, Abby uh, Willer yep. from the agency, because um, sure. we're getting close to our, our end time here. And uh, Jake's bandwidth is a little low, even though he's literally across the, the room from me. So uh, Abby, you want to take it, take it from here? You're taking it from me, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, I'm happy to. And, and I'll just also respond really quickly um, to Representative O'Brien's comment. I think, first of all, I like the reference to this plan as the big book. I think that's a great reference. I like that. Um, but I'd also say, I think there are a variety of, of briefs in here that talk about the environmental, the soil health, um, the payment for ecosystem services brief is something to take a look at. Um, but just the general concept of Vermont being a state that markets and promotes the value added attributes of our food products is really, really important. And I think we do that and that has built the reputation of quality and integrity that Vermont products have. And the reason that we haven't had a buy local campaign um, in this state for, for quite a few years um, because the entrepreneurs have done it done it for us in many ways. But um, I've also been thinking recently about adding to that list, this promotion of the true and actual co real cost of food as a way for Vermont to differentiate itself as what makes us different than other states. And that addresses that we're, you know, paying real wages, we're taking care of the environment, we, you know, care about um, being accurate in our business models to capture the cost of production. So that'd be a fun one to talk about. I think We'd have to yep. bring Mark Canella in and other kind of business-minded folks to sort of see what the consequences to that model might be to have Vermont become known as the, the state with the expensive food. But um, anyway, <laughs> no, I, I think there's a lot of price, Fair price for food. Right, and that's that's right. I think that's the important difference. So um, anyway, that's a, that's a future conversation. So um, I, I'm just so grateful to have had the opportunity to listen to all these authors talk about the intelligence and the intel that they have from the industries and the, the issues that they've worked on for so many years share both today, but also incorporate into the plan. And so I'm gonna let Ellen kind of do our final farewell, but before we do that, I just wanted to share a couple things, both how we at the Agency of Agriculture imagine that we'll be using this plan and then run through it might be a little bit clunky, but run through a few examples of how, how the plan can actually be used, because I think it is an overwhelming document and there's a lot of content here that rather than miss the opportunities to know how to use it, we'll, we'll walk through it really quickly. So um, I'll start by just saying, you know, as a representative of the Agency of Agriculture and from the Ag Development Division, I and members of our team and our agency throughout are asked routinely to testify and give specific industry need or market development opportunities um, and testify on these various issues about how to improve the success and the viability of agriculture in our state. And when we offer that testimony and that perspective, we're able to draw upon research and data and then firsthand knowledge of what we know the challenges to be and what we think uh, where opportunities exist and then strategies that we could suggest on where to focus. 
the beauty of this plan is that now everybody has access to that fundamental and foundational information as long as you take a chance to read it. And so I just feel that's such an important opportunity that all the contributors, the 1500 different voices that are captured in this plan have made possible. So, but specifically for the agency, I, we intend to use the goals and the strategies in this plan, as well as the information that's laid out in the 54 individual briefs as resources and reference points of where should we start on a particular issue or who should we call, who were the authors uh, that contributed to that piece and where do we need to focus our staff efforts, our program development and target funding. Of the 34 priority strategies, we'll look to these as real direction for our work. And this will be um, the ideas that we offer as approaches to achieve that economic development and that equity in our food system and ensure the environmental sustainability and access to healthy local food for all Vermonters. So we have those priority strategies in this plan and that <clears throat> we'll continue to reference. I know we'll also refer to the 15 goals when we're talking about collaborative projects and funding requests. And then we'll look to those objectives um, to monitor our progress. And I have been inspired by the plan's vision and, and our team that's been working once a week on this for the past year and a half, when um, at the inauguration, when we had the Poet Laureate share sort of just this vision for the world and the country, it really, I think, reminded me that we've created a similar vision. Um, we have collectively created a similar vision for Vermont agriculture, for our businesses, our community members, and we need to refer to that vision anytime we're connecting with new partners and we need inspiration or we know um, why it's important to make investments in our state's food system. So how fortunate that we have such a document at this time to rely upon. Um, <coughs> Again, acknowledging there's lots to read in this plan. I wanna just talk briefly about ways that I think this could be valuable to you as legislators and then, and then walk through, through a few examples. Um, consider inviting Agency of Ag or Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund staff in to testify um, and include the brief authors to discuss the issues that they're outlined in the briefs. I would say look at the priority strategies and the complete list of recommendations for the critical areas when you're thinking about where to invest or what new programs are needed or what policy changes will strengthen or sustain the health of our food system. I think so much of the information is here in this plan and gives us a place to start. So um, about how to kind of navigate through the document. So I think there's a couple of different ways. I think first you can start at the beginning um, and identify with one of the 15 goals that you really wanna see achieved in the food system or become a priority for a committee or for an individual. And then you get to trace that to um, the priority strategies um, that begin on page 29 of the written copy. And I think probably page 31 for the PDF. I think it's about two pages off. And those priority strategies um, should help reach that priority goal that you've identified. And then you get to flip later in the document to page 193 in the paper, 195 in the digital, which includes the table of sources. And that table of sources then connects those priority strategies to the specific briefs that include the detail about the sector, about the market, or about the issue. And those individual briefs include those specific recommendations that offer policy suggestions or investment areas that have already been kind of vetted and suggested by the industry experts. Or you can do it the opposite way, which is you can start with a specific brief that there's a sector or there's an issue or there's a market that you're most interested in addressing. And then you can follow the recommendations in that specific brief back through that same table of sources on page 193, to then aggregate up to the priority strategy on pages beginning on page 29. And then you can see how that connects to one of the larger and bigger kind of goals of our food system for the next 10 years. So here's two examples that I thought we could do. Um, and, I, and I don't wanna take too much time because I know Ellen needs to talk for a minute more. Um, so we could take goal um, 18 
or actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do priority 18. So this was what Representative Strong referenced. was like, how do we redesign the state's education funding model? And so if you look at strategic priority 18, um, you can see that that relates to goals four and five for the food system. And then if you go to page 197, this shows how that strategic priority connects to recommendations of in seven different briefs. And so then you could look at those two of those briefs. So let's take labor and workforce and labor and workforce brief has two recommendations that um, address to how we could make state education funding models more sustainable. Or you could, and, that, and so that brief is on page 166. Or you could look at the agricultural literacy brief on page 130, and there's two recommendations, recommendation four and five of that brief that address some of the same issues. And then you could also look at those two briefs and say, look at these authors, uh, many from UVM Extension, Mary Peabody, uh, Sarah Kleiman from UVM Extension, uh, Dana Hudson from Shelburne Farms, Vera simon Nobes. These are individuals that you could actually ask to testify that have sort of worked in this field are sort of experts in this arena and would be great people to talk about yeah. education funding and including more agricultural components. So um, that's one example and we could, we could do more and I think that we're happy to come in and, and talk um, more about it. Um, so I think at this point, we just have to stay focused and keep working together and know that we have a really wonderful unified plan um, to address kind of the next 10 years. Thanks. Thank you, Abby. <clears throat> so just in wrapping up again, I just so want to thank you for dedicating this amount of time uh, for all of us to come and talk with you. We could have gone on for many, many, many more hours. There's so many more briefs that we didn't even talk about yet. But we know we've got time, you know, we, we have other parts of this session, but also, as you know, this is a 10 year plan. And, uh, and so we're going to, we're going to keep focused on uh, the different pieces of this plan and, and try to move it forward with you. Uh, I want to thank all of the <clears throat> presenters today uh, for being here and helping out and for the agency of ag and your partnership. Um, and I think What's really key for me uh, in all of this to remember is that something that Jake said at the very beginning, this is not the stable jobs plan. This is not the agency's plan. This is all of our plan. This is, you asked for this and we, we pre we're presenting it here, but we all own it. And so thus we all need to be working together in a collaborative way to implement it. And that's what we're all intending to do. And we're excited to work with you on that. Uh, and as Abby said, please call on us, uh, call on the individual brief authors and the contributors to help you think about the best ways to, to pass policy, to provide resources, and just overall support for this growing industry because the opportunities are, are very big. Uh, there's a lot of bright spots. There's definitely challenges and bottlenecks, that, but they're all things we can overcome if we really do it together. So I just really wanna thank you again for your time, your interest, your passion for local food, yeah. uh, and uh, we'll, we'll keep talking with you uh, as we go forward. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Ellen, and, and all of you folks. Um, it uh, certainly, uh, is a great plan. I think. I know we talked earlier in the week in my committee on the Senate side, uh, excited about it. And it gives us a lot of um, backing to move forward uh, with proposals. And, um, you know, so I, I think you deserve a lot of credit and, and thanks for presenting to us the so-called big book. Um, uh, and um, so we'll be uh, we'll be hearing more from you as as time goes on and and getting um, some of the witnesses in that you heard from as well to verify and and push us in the right direction. Carolyn, did you have anything in closing? Uh, Bobby, I would just add a, a big thanks to everybody who worked on this. Uh, we're referring it to, the, uh, to it as the big book. I'm sort of thinking at it as the uh, agricultural Bible. And um, I, I want to thank all of the, the 1,500 people that worked on this. This is really an incredible piece of work. 
I really appreciate the data this included and um, uh, can't say enough to uh, thank you all. Yep. So with that, I guess we'll say goodbye and...